Welcome everyone. My name is Jenny Stisher. Welcome to our Market Links webinar. We're delighted to have you. Thanks so much for joining. We're going to go ahead and get started. We expect a lot more people to be joining. And first, we would like to just uh, take a moment and uh, just take you through WebEx in case this could be one of your first times joining. Um, we just want to make sure that you know how and ever, where to find things and how everything works. So first, I'd like to draw your attention um, to the mute button, or you won't have a mute button. This is a listen-only session. This is a this could be uh, different for you in that respect. You won't have to manage your mute and unmute button today. It is a listen-only. And then I'd also like to draw your attention. Um, sometimes when you join WebEx, the participant panel may open or it might be closed. And I'd like to show you where to find that. In the bottom right hand corner of your screen, there's a humanoid figure with a couple lines through it. Now you click on that, that opens up the participant panel and you can see everyone here in the room, the host, the panelists and you as a participant. And then also right next to that humanoid button is the uh, chat button. This will open up the chat panel for you, and this is where you're going to be very active today. You can go ahead and click on that. You'll see the chat panel open, and this is where you can enter your text. And then you can also send a private message. If you see that to and that everyone and the down arrow, if you click on that, you can choose someone and send a private message. If you're having any issues, um, technically, you can definitely reach out to myself. I'm Jenny Stisher. And then just make sure you come back to the everyone uh, selection so that your next messages come back to the whole group. So throughout our session, these panels will expand or collapse uh, depending on what is being presented. So you can always go back and find those two panels in that place. I also want to mention that we have closed captions available today. You can locate those in the bottom left hand corner of your screen. There's a little CC button. Just click on that. You can choose your language and then the captions will roll right on your screen. And then to hide them, just tap on that again. We also have a link that we're putting into our chat. We have live uh, uh, captioning going on as well. This is an external link. So when you click on that, it will open up a separate browser tabs, but that will give you live captions coming through our captioner, Julia. Um, and if you have any questions, do feel free to let us know. Um, we're happy to have you here. And we're gonna go ahead and kick us off. Um, and I'm going to, um, on behalf of the Market Links production team, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's session, Andrew Nelson, economist and entrepreneurial environment team lead for USAID Center for Economics and Market Development. Welcome, Andrew, and over to you. Great, thank you so much. Really appreciate um, you and everyone at Market Links for making this possible. And of course, all of our participants who are um, still flooding in. So um, great to see you. So we're gonna have a great session today on um, the evidence update on small and medium enterprises with our three speakers. Um, I believe Jenny has hit most of the um, important things to note, but let me just add a, a couple of things uh, for everybody here. This session is, of course, being recorded and including the chat, everyone. And and the uh, the recording will be made available on the Market Links uh, website for everybody afterwards. If you have any tech issues whatsoever, please reach out to um, Jenny Stisher. She can help sort all of those out. As she mentioned, um, thanks everybody for, um, I see a flood of uh, new and familiar and old and uh, old faces um, with the uh, introductions here in the chat. Please keep those coming. We are going to um, use this chat function to um, hold and keep track of all of your questions uh, through these presentations. So just um, flood them in and then we are going to have our three presentations and then get to all the questions. We have some great presentations. So we want to make sure we have time for those. And um, finally, we will also have a, uh, a poll or a survey at the end. Um, so please hang on till the end. Um, it's going to be worthwhile. Um, and partly this is because we really do believe in generating and using evidence and um, you're all great observations for us. So we welcome your insights and feedback um, in that kind of structured way here at the end. So our um, 
our session, we have um, three wonderful speakers. Um, the first, um, well, is uh, Anna Goiko Echea. She's a senior economist at the World Bank Group. Um, she is in the finance competitive and innovate and innovation global practice at the World Bank. She leads the competitiveness policy evaluation lab or COMPEL. Um, and that aims to conduct impact evaluations to inform development policies and programs related to private sector development. Um, next, we have Kayo Pisa. He is a senior economist on the Development Impact Evaluation Unit at the World Bank, and he currently leads impact evaluations in trading competitiveness. Um, he's an applied econometrician with interests from microfinance education to labor economics. So very pleased to have him. And then um, finally, Sarah Eisler, she's the team lead for, evidence, for the evidence review update um, led by Integra. She's as an independent consultant, she's an evaluation specialist uh, by training with technical expertise in myth, mixed method research design and analysis, women's empowerment, gender, and small-scale agriculture and development. So we're very pleased to have all of our uh, speakers today. And so without further ado, I would like to kick it over to our first presenter. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining the webinar today. Um, we're excited to present some updates from a recent evidence review that we conducted for USAID on high growth, small and medium enterprise development. Um, like Andrew said, my name is Sarah Eisler, and I will be presenting on behalf of the Integra team. Um, so just to share our team, um, the team that conducted this evidence review includes myself, our colleague, Mohammed Masalam as a lead economist, and Penelope Norton as our project coordinator and research associate, and both are joining us today. Um, so we were tasked with updating an evidence review that was originally published in 2019 that had examined the available published evidence to support multiple evidence-based theories of change that identified what strategies, approaches, interventions, et cetera, that promote growth among small and medium enterprises. Um, this review only selected studies that focused on low and middle income countries, small and medium enterprises. So we did not look at any studies that looked at micro enterprises, um, as well as those that employed an experimental design. So our aim was first to review new evidence that was published since the previous report. So we looked at any new studies that fit this selection criteria published since 2018. And then we um, look, use this evidence to update the previous report with the new evidence. So while there was limited new evidence published since 2018 to review, um, we did identify new findings and evidence that uh, strengthened the existing theories of change and expanded upon the previous re review. So the theories of change that we had reviewed and looked at included those relevant to business management practices, access to finance, business registration and taxes, market access, innovation, and then in this recent update, we also searched for evidence on the intersection of climate and SMEs. And we also added a discussion on effective approaches for targeting SMEs with high growth potential. And so while we cannot cover all of the evidence and content that's included in our report, today we're focusing on some highlights from recent evidence that we did review um, and that was really exciting, namely on consulting practices and equity finance. And then we also will address some of the remaining gaps in the evidence that do require further study. Um, but we do encourage all of you to download and read the full evidence or review report to learn more about any of the other topics, as well as additional specifics um, on the topics that we're presenting today. So first, we will present some interesting new evidence on the effectiveness of different consulting strategies to promote SME growth. So these two studies that were published in 2020 and 2021 suggest that individually tailored consulting services to SMEs that aim to promote growth continue to be an expensive option 
and that the market to develop these services is slow growing. Uh, they provide evidence on the effectiveness of two other types of approaches to delivering consulting services, including group, a group-based approach, as well as in and outsourcing services. So a study published by Iacovoni and all in 2021 tested the effectiveness of the group-based approach, consulting approach compared to the more expensive individual consulting approach in an experiment with 159 auto part firms in Colombia. And it found that both types of approaches resulted in similar improvements in management practices. However, the new group-based approach provide, proved to be more cost-effective um, and it was only a third of the cost to implement compared to the individual consulting service. However, it was important to note that while the study demonstrated that this was a more cost effective approach, um, the sample size wasn't large enough to allow for recommendations on the types of firms that it could best support. So further research and further evidence is necessary. The second approach entails acquiring the expertise of skills, skilled professionals who are either hired into the firm, so insourcing services or externally contracted or outsource, outsourcing services to perform functions such as sales, marketing, finance, or accounting. Um, I'm not sure the video is the presentation is changed. Um, there we go. Great. And so um, a study published by Anderson and McKenzie published in 2020 had tested this hypothesis um, through a randomized controlled field experiment in, uh, in which 753 firms in Nigeria were split into one of five experimental groups. Um, th these five groups included training, consulting, insourcing, outsourcing, and then a control group. And the study found that the insourcing and outsourcing interventions outperformed the personalized consulting service on a value for money basis by having a similar impact on business practices and growth, but at half the cost. However, it is important to note that such market based solutions are more applicable to larger firms that have several employees and already identified high growth potential as opposed to subsistence level firms. So hence, with consulting services, firms might still need to overcome financial constraints and uncertainty before deciding to per pursue this option. Um, so more evidence is needed to understand the impact of different types of consulting services and options for promoting growth among newer or smaller businesses. And then next, um, we'll present some new exciting evidence on the impact of equity financing as a viable option for SME owners to promote the growth of their businesses. So we draw from three studies that were published in 2018 and 2020 that examined factors influencing SME owners' willingness and preferences to pursue private equity or alternative forms of financing options and the impact these options have on the growth of certain types of SMEs. So first we'll talk about a study published by Ibaduni et al. in 2018 that assessed the outcomes of 233 technology-based SMEs uh, owners' financing strategies in Nigeria using a survey-based experimental design. They found that venture capital and business donations significantly influenced the profit growth of these SMEs compared to personal savings and business loans, which did not have a significant effect on profit growth. And that uh, while the venture capital and business donations did have a, a significant positive effect on profit growth, they did not have a significant effect on sales or employee growth. Um, they also found that the firm owners can enhance their access to financing options, particularly through bank loans, venture capital and business loans uh, through capacity building um, and entrepreneurial and competencies, such as acquiring the right skills or attitudes around you know, their in innovativeness, willingness to take risk um, and levels of independence. So the authors found that there was a positive significant effect on the owner's skills in accessing business loans, venture capital and business donations, whereas the owner's attitudes only had a significantly positive effect on their ability to access venture capital and business donations. The next study, published by Kimani in 2020, used a discrete choice experiment with SMEs in Nairobi to understand owners' financing preferences. They found that interest rates were the most important attributes for owners to determine which financing options to pursue, 
followed by uh, the form of collateral, and then uh, next, the speed of accessibility. Um, and then they also found that the most preferred source of financing among small enterprise owners was found to be mobile banking, followed by savings and credit cooperative organizations, or SCCOs, and then finally commercial banks. And then finally, a third study published by INEE in 2018 applied both propensity score matching and difference in difference estimation techniques at a national level in Ghana to assess the effects of venture capital financing on SME growth. They used panel data to understand the enabling of factors that drive cap venture capital investments. Um, and their results showed a significant positive association between venture capital financing um, and SME growth and suggest that certain factors and conditions such as GDP growth rate, labor market rigidities, capital gains taxes, and institutional quality are the key drivers of venture capital investments in Ghana. The findings also show that certain socioeconomic factors such as the owner's gender, experience, geographical location, business plan, social networks, and interest rate charges uh, influence the owner's ability to obtain venture capital financing, whereas other key factors such as their age, the owner's age, their marital status, their educational attainment, the firm's size and age, the firm's legal status and sector did not have a significant effect on the owner's ability to obtain venture capital funding. So, for example, breaking that down a little bit, the study found that women SME owners were less likely to seek and obtain venture capital financing than men, as women owners were found to prefer using internal financing options compared to external ones. So while these three studies um, on equity financing provide interesting new evidence on the factors influencing SMEs owners' willingness to pursue these alternative forms of financing and how these may influence SME growth, more evidence is needed to better understand how these alternative forms of financing can be used to promote growth among certain types of SMEs, as well as in different contexts. So finally, throughout this review, we've identified many remaining evidence gaps that require further study. We present these specific gaps in more detail in the report, um, which again, we would encourage you to download and read if you're interested in uh, learning more. So in general, um, we found the further evidence is required to better understand the impact of key strategies, approaches, or assistance for promoting and yielding SME growth, including the impact of uh, advanced training, matching grants, private equity, financial technology applications, domestic and market linkages, export promotion, business formalization, the reduction of tax compliance and product and process innovation on SME growth. And while this recent review was able to identify some studies that examine differences between entrepreneurs' uh, characteristics, there does remain a large evidence gap on the impact of interventions on firms with different characteristics, including but not necessarily limited to the life cycle stage of the firm. So whether they're startup, early stage, growth, mature. Um, the age of the firm, and the gender and the age of the owner. So, for example, we did identify many studies that examine the impact of interventions on businesses with men and women, men or women owners. However, these had uh, primarily focused on micro enterprises, which were beyond the scope of this, this review um, and are typically not poised to promote growth. Um, so there needs to be further studies on understanding the impact of interventions on SME growth for SMEs, not microenterprises, with men and women entrepreneurs. And then finally, this review um, did look at evidence around the intersection of climate and SME growth, and we were only able to identify one study that fit our criteria that had examined how entrepreneurs manage climate-related risks and how that informs their decision-making. So there's a need for more research focusing on effective approaches for supporting SME growth while navigating risk management, particularly in the context of climate change, but also in other potential sources of key risk. So including, but not limited to global health, um, political or economic crises, corruption or others. And so with that, we will conclude our presentation of the evidence review update and thank you all for your time. Um, and we welcome any questions in the chat box um, at the end of this throughout and then also at the end of this webinar.
Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Sarah, if you can let me know. Yes, we can hear you, Anna. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Uh, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am Anna. I work in the Finance Competitiveness and Innovation Unit from, for the World Bank. And this is the unit that deals with private sector development in general. In here, what we have been doing uh, is implementing this initiative called COMPEL, Competitiveness Policy Evaluation Lab. Um, and we have been uh, doing this in partnership with uh, you, with USA, uh, for about 10 years. So this initiative is about uh, setting up and implementing impact evaluation studies. And as you may know, these are studies that uh, are conducted in a very specific way. So we set up certain standards for this study to select uh, these studies. Um, first, all of the studies needed to build and contrafactual. That means that when you are assessing the impact of a program, you needed to identify a group of, for example, firms that are similar to those that will participate in the, in the program, but that we will track and measure, but they are not participating in the program. And we needed to set up those contrafactuals in a very rigorous way. So that is the first standard that all studies needed to meet. The second standard that all study, studies needed to meet uh, was one of technical quality. So they had to, uh, to be uh, built with certain um, uh, features, for example, when it comes to data collection, uh, the counterfactual I mentioned, as well as uh, the implementation plan that they will be presenting. And they have to be of a quality that puts them or have the potential to put them in an academic economic journal. And the first standard that we set up is that all these studies needed to increase or improve the quality of the country programs. Uh, and so uh, these three uh, features of, of the studies uh, drove our uh, initiative. So they had to have contrafactuals, they need to be quality, uh, journal quality, caliber, and they needed to increase or improve the quality of country programs. How did we do this? So we first invest a lot of resources in capacity building. So we would go and work directly with the government uh, agencies or, they, or private sector entities implementing these programs. And uh, we would spend some time um, sort of sharing our knowledge on this type of methodology, impact evaluation, and showing them how this will be useful for managing their programs. So capacity building was key. Uh, the second is uh, to set up processes to provide technical feedback. And for these, uh, we connected with different units in the World Bank uh, that also do impact evaluation, like the Development Impact Evaluation Unit, as well as externally, like the j initiative or some specific academics, depending on the topic. And we created sort of committees or groups that would provide the research teams feedback at different points in time. Sometimes we even would impose a little bit of knowledge sharing by setting up certain clinics with researchers for studies that were not ready, but mid-course, so that they can improve their quality. So, so having said this, I want to show you in two minutes today um, how we thought about uh, this program. And um, in terms of topics and in terms of the studies that we conducted. So first we focus on the firm. And from the firm point of view, we sort of thought about what are the key constraints that firms face. And they, there may be many different classifications of how uh, constraints can be grouped, but we thought these four are key ones. So first is a lack of managerial and organizational skills, also lack of access to finance, lack of local demand or linkages to market, and uh, lastly, uh, high regulatory compliant co compliance costs. So based on these constraints, we went ahead and identified in our portfolio, uh, what are the, inter we call it interventions, but these are, what are the tools or the solutions that can address those constraints? And we have, 
you know, all this list of, of um, uh, options. Now, if uh, we have problems with uh, capabilities or managerial skills, you have programs that offer training, labor incentives, or you have consulting that Sarah just uh, mentioned, um, support to innovation, etc. No, uh, and the idea then was to set up pilots. This, each study would pilot solutions, but generally they pilot a package of solution. So it could be one study that is piloting training combined with a grant, for example, and this would uh, sort of try to address not only the capability or skills uh, constraint, but also the access to finance constraints. So uh, the first message is uh, that I want to convey is that it, these studies typically they measure packages of solutions, not only one isolated solution. And of course, uh, this would provide, you can read through it later, but this would provide uh, certain uh, firms with certain uh, offerings with the intention of generating changes, like changing uh, their managerial practices or making firms adopt technologies, and in the long run, improving their productivity, for example, or making firms grow. So this was our sort of very general theory of change for the program. Um, and then uh, I wanted to show you uh, some of the um, some of the studies. The ones in green are the ones that we are uh, implementing or completed uh, in partnership with USAID. And uh, these studies, as you can see, they are testing uh, many different uh, sort of offerings. For example. In Ghana, they combine uh, grants with group consulting. The one that you see here in Kenya is a business plan competition when they uh, try to identify firms with high growth potential. So how do you identify firms with high growth potential? Well, this pilot uh, uses the, plan the business plan competition to filter out those that sort of uh, do better through the competition and then supporting those that, that make certain stages. Uh, so they provided the business plan, and after that they are monitored on their goals, and if they meet the, their goals, they get a second trench of financing and so forth. So the competition acts as a filter uh, to self-select firms that have more potential. Uh, the one in Mexico is testing something different, is testing large grants for innovations. Uh, so this uh, study is important because they are not only testing the impact of a grant, but they are also comparing the selection mechanisms. So in one set of, um, in, on one side, they select the winners of these grants in, in a traditional manner through the government agency. And on the, sec on the other hand, they have a panel of venture capitalists or experts, and they are comparing these two selection mechanisms as well as the impact of the grant. And the one in Nigeria is the one that Sarah shared with you with insourcing and outsourcing and, and training and, and so forth. And the other uh, here, for example, when it comes to connecting linkages and connecting to markets, uh, we have uh, two impact evaluations, one in Kenya and one in Georgia. And they are uh, testing or, you know, uh, piloting ways to uh, promote firms, to, to encourage firms to, to sell their products uh, online. And today you are going to hear uh, right in a few minutes, in a minute, you're going to hear from Cayo on the results of the Georgia impact evaluation. And then on access to finance, uh, you may have thought that this was a, a field that was full, you know, full of evidence. And it's true that there is uh, a group of evidence dealing with financial literacy uh, some years ago. But now what we're looking into is what are these non-traditional options for SMEs to access finance. So, for example, different alternatives to traditional collaterals or uh, guarantee schemes. And there are not many studies on that front. Uh, so, so we are uh, right now implementing uh, some studies uh, in, in that front, but, but this is a new area for development. 
Um, so, so one last message before I, I pass to Kayo is that these studies are long. They typically take, take uh, some time because we, we need to implement the program and then wait for the impacts to materialize. So if you give a grant to a firm, you may spend a year, uh, you know, uh, disbursing the grant, but then you need to wait for the firm to use it, make decisions, and eventually change their practices and change their productivity, and then you can measure the impacts two years along the way, right? So, so these studies take a little bit of time depending on the length of the program. And we, on purpose, uh, design these groups. So we are conducting groups of studies on similar topics. And the idea here is to drive our portfolio decisions. So, so earlier today, Sarah was mentioning these two studies, no? uh, the one in Colombia on group consulting and the one in Nigeria on insourcing and outsourcing. So the story behind that, uh, it's sort of an evolution of the priorities of the portfolio, where the World Bank started before many years ago offering firms traditional training. This means you go and you offer a module on accounting or a module on financing. How do you do the financing so, of your firm? Um, and we started measuring that through this type of studies and we realized that we were not having, the evidence was very mixed. We were not having a good impact. So that then uh, evolved to alternative training content. And there were a couple of uh, projects that were trying and piloting personal initiative training. So what if instead of uh, you know, uh, teaching concepts, specific concepts, we try to teach um, traits, like uh, how do you solve a problem? How do you set up your goals? How do you organize yourself? So these were a different type of training and we found that it had more impact. So then our portfolio changed from tradi offering traditional training to offering more projects implementing this personal initiative training. Then there were the studies on consulting. There was in Mexico, in India, and these studies show that, you know, if you go ahead and invest in very specialized consulting, the productivity of firms grow very much and firms grow a lot. But these specialized consulting are super expensive. For example, in the, the study in India, that was with a handful of firms, each firms receive around $75,000. So this is consulting that of course is impactful, but it's very, very expensive. And this was subsidized by the way, because the, the private provider uh, sort of provided a, a special rate because it was a research program, 50% of market rate. So we're talking about a consulting a uh, program that may cost $150,000 per firm, which is super expensive. So based on that uh, sort of limitation, we thought, okay, what can we do that is more cost effective? And then the, the idea of group consulting came about, this is the study in Colombia. And the, the last study in Nigeria, the beauty of it is that it compares everything. It compares training, it compares consulting, it compares the market uh, solutions like insourcing and outsourcing. So I wanted to tell you that story to, to convey how these ideas evolve and also change the, the priorities of our program. Uh, and the last challenge, the, the current challenge that we have is that we have found in these years you know, we advance a lot on the private sector development angle. There are lots of more studies. When I started working on these, all the impact evaluations were on health and not many on private sector development. Now we can show, you know, a review of evidence and we have uh, groups of studies. But the challenge we are facing now is one of scalability. So even the larger studies are a couple thousand firms, 2,000, 5,000 firms. And our uh, challenge is how do we make these programs work for 100,000 firms or for, you know, a million firms? And, and this is our challenge. We need to think very carefully. We need to continue and pushing this agenda into how can we implement all these programs that we found impactful at scale. 
So I will stop here. I wanted to leave you with that thought on scalability. And now let's hear from uh, Cayo on the results of the Georgia e-commerce study. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Great. Thank Andrew. you, Rihanna. Over to you, Cayo. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, can you hear me well? Uh, yes, we can hear you great. Thank you. Great. So, yeah, uh, first of all, thanks for, for inviting me to, to present uh, preliminary uh, results of this paper. Um, thank you for the participants for joining today. So today, as Anna said, I'm going to talk about a project that was financed by the Compel team here at the World Bank and also with funding indirectly from USAID. So it's a very, um, you know, we're in, at home. I feel at home uh, uh, presenting these results to you guys today. Uh, it's important to, to mention that the still ongoing project, uh, we don't have like uh, the final results yet, but we do have interesting results on take up of technology, uh, in this case, e-commerce. So let me uh, just say that this is a joint work with uh, my colleague here uh, in Dime, uh, Aidan Colville, who pretty much led all the, uh, the work from, from our side. Uh, we have an um, external principal investigator from uh, Urban Champaign, uh, Adam Osman, and, and myself. We had a lot of uh, uh, research assistants joining uh, throughout. Uh, I couldn't acknowledge all of them here, but uh, you're going to see them in the, uh, all the names in the paper. Um, okay, just to, you know, very briefly, uh, just say that digital uh, commerce is is growing worldwide, and uh, during the COVID, uh, for example, it got very clear that uh, businesses that were already digital uh, had advantage over others to secure demand and keep alive. Um, but the COVID also showed that business would have to shift uh, to digital world uh, soon if they wanted to to keep keep up with demand and with this new world that emerged uh, with the pandemic. However, uh, still the vast majority of micro, small, medium-sized enterprises uh, don't have an online presence. So the question is, uh, we ask in this project is, is it because they don't have the skills to set up their web pages, et cetera, or is you know lack of incentives? They don't perceive uh, any associated returns uh, in, in going online, you know? Is it like a more like a demand side constraint? Like, uh, I don't think it's worth it, uh, or it's more like a, uh, a supply side constraint, they don't have these skills. So this is exactly what we do in this project. We run two randomized control trials, um, aim to increase online presence of small businesses in Georgia, Georgia country, not state, uh, US state, okay? So uh, here the, the target is like small businesses. We don't have micro enterprises. I'm gonna give a flavor later on of how this business look like in our study. Uh, basically, we run two experiments. In the first one, we evaluate the impact of a training program, a light touch training program. I will describe a little bit about what it entails. And the second experiment, we have like a demand shock intervention. This is some idea that we came up with uh, during the project that we'll explain, I'll explain a little bit better um, uh, later on. Um, basically, we don't find impacts of the training program on adoption of e-commerce, uh, but on the other hand, the one-off demand shock um, increased uptake of e-commerce by 26% uh, in the short term, and the fact is very heterogeneous go up to 50% depending on uh, the group we we evaluate the impact on. Um, if, um, let me just give you a, a little bit of idea of how Georgia uh, looks like. You know, Georgia has a like, GDP per person employed. It's not GDP per capita. It is per person employed of $37,000 a year. It's a country that has grown substantially over the last decade, 5% on average. It was hit pretty bad by the COVID during the 2020, but 2021 it bounced back pretty, uh, pretty well. Uh, it still faces a high unemployment rate of 10%. Um, 
you know, it's a country that uh, most of businesses are small and surprisingly very few actually uh, have an online presence. So this actually give us an idea, uh, you know, of the opportunities in place to also expand infrastructure of high speed internet broadband, for example, and also uh, connect, try to connect these businesses to, um, you know, this online world, make them digital and so on. Um, so the program we evaluate is called Broadband for Developed. It's a component of the Georgia National Innovation Ecosystem Program that was supported by the World Bank. So it was a World Bank project uh, in, uh, you know, that started in 2015 and uh, it finished last year. So the project offered an e-commerce training intervention. That's the idea. That's why we evaluated its training program aimed to increase the business online presence. The idea here is, uh, you know, help this business go online and this would help eventually help them uh, access markets, uh, increase their linkages and grow. So that was the, the prior uh, underlying this, uh, this uh, you know, that's the rationale of the program. So the program provide also a subsidy for broadband internet, you know, for a business that didn't have like a high access to high speed internet, the program provides some subsidy for them to cover fixed cost to set up their broadband connection. So because it could be that, you know, business don't have the resources to invest in this high speed internet, that's why they don't go online, but, you know, the program sort of, uh, you know, uh, overcame the, the issue by providing the subsidies for business to, to set up the, their broadband connection. So here that a training intervention was a three day face to face training on uh, e commerce uh, basics this day one, for example, um, you know, um, uh, the businesses that joined the intervention, they learn how to use Google, Facebook, Instagram, and, you know, all these platforms to increase the visibility of their own businesses, what they do, what they sell, and so on. Um, they, too, uh, they focus on, you know, understanding customers' profiles, what customers are looking for, you know, how they could eventually tap, tap that demand in the market. You know, they, for example, uh, uh, taught their business how to register in e-commerce e platforms such as bookings.com, Airbnb, and so on. Uh, day three, they uh, focused on, uh, you know, helping this business, developing the uh, business model to access, for example, for some financial opportunities and also participate in public procurement opportunities. There is evidence, for example, showing that small businesses that um, are select for public procurement, uh, you know, pretty much sell to the government, they grow faster because it's kind of secure demand for, for what they sell, right? So this is, uh, ironically, very few small business actually participate in these auctions um, and don't take advantage of these opportunities. So for the impact evaluation, we, we actually have uh, basic, very basic questions in the first randomized control trial, basically ask uh, if, you know, the training program can increase firms' participation in online markets? And if so, if that affects the firm's uh, performance. Uh, in the second randomized trial, we, we test whether uh, a short-term demand shock, like securing online orders, uh, increase adoption of e-commerce, and of, of course, down the line, affect their presence online and performance. We don't have uh, answers yet for this, uh, you know, medium term effects and uh, performance. So we're gonna focus here on the impact on adoption of e-commerce. Which is a big deal, by the way, because most of these training interventions, et cetera, uh, faces this challenge of, you know, this first step's pretty challenging, like increase or oh, secure high take up uh, in training programs and, you know, high application to matching grants and so on. So here we are pretty much testing which of these two strategies is more successful at securing high demand or, or high take up uh, for, for uh, or high adoption of technology we, we, are, we would like them to do, right? 
So here, this is a study sample. Um, back in 2018, we conduct a baseline survey. Uh, we interviewed a little bit more than 2,000 uh, uh, firms. This was a phone survey. Then we uh, <clears throat> top up sample with uh, a little bit around 300 firms later on. Then we split this uh, firms. Uh, we have um, about 850 firms that uh, registered uh, and were, uh, were included in the training uh, program. Oh, um, so they could be randomized to receive the training, training or not. So we have uh, 69 program, uh, firms that uh, had to be dropped because they are located uh, in, in regions that, not, that were not covered by the project. We also had to drop uh, a substantial number of firms due to contamination, 824 firms. Um, you know, by the we, we had these firms in the baseline and uh, the uh, implementing agencies started like offering the training to everybody and didn't realize that some of the firms that uh, they were offering to uh, were in the base, baseline sample. So uh, unfortunately we, we missed uh, almost 50% of the sample. And uh, there are also a big chunk of firms that were not interested uh, in, the, in, in uh, registering to, to the training program. So it's important to say here that the, all these 2,145 firms said on the phone survey that they were interested in the training program. So we did sort of a screening uh, upfront. So, okay, we're gonna keep in the baseline only firms that said they would be willing to participate in the training. But later on, uh, about 700 firms said, well, we are not interested anymore. Uh, so we, we, we had to, to drop all these firms from the sample. At the end of the day, we are left with 858 firms uh, for this training experiment. Uh, we randomly assign uh, 638 firms to treatment and two, uh, 220 firms to the control group. Uh, I'll focus on the training program for now, then I'll come back to the demand shock intervention later on. So here's a, you know, just a flavor of uh, how these firms look like in the, in the sample. These firms have uh, between five to six employees. Um, they're small. 50% uh, of them uh, had a computer, which is surprisingly low. Uh, less than 3% had a website, and less than 10% received online orders. This is back in 2018. It's not back to 20, 2008, right? It's 2018, just like a few years ago. Um, but uh, we then conduct a, a follow-up survey in, in July 2021 with all these firms, uh, 858 businesses, we had a response rate of 52%, uh, 72%. And in this survey, we focused on outcomes related to online presence because the idea here is just to know if firms actually adopting or selling online or adopting technology to, to be able to sell online. So the demand shock intervention, um, we did the following. Among the 858 firms in the original training randomization sample, we consider firms that complete the online survey in 2021, the follow-up survey, were still active in 2021, uh, had products or service available during the planned period for the, of the intervention, which was uh, end of uh, uh, mid-2022, uh, had indicated in the follow-up survey in 2021 that they were not currently selling online, but we're willing to. So we pretty much screen all these businesses and we are left with 141 business only. Then we added 147 firms that did not register to the training, but said they were willing to sell online. So we are left with around 300 firms for this demand shock experiment. And this is how we randomly assigned them to each of the treatment arms. First, we stratify the firms based on their propensity to sell online. We could identify firms with low, medium, high propensity to sell online. And then we randomly assign them to uh, peer control, so firms that wouldn't receive any online order. 76 firms uh, received a low demand shock of $130. Why $130? Because this was, this was pretty much the, 
the amount of the training co uh, the training program cost per firm. So the training program costs about 130 per firm. Okay, and we also uh, uh, test the the effect of um, a high demand shock, which is like a seven hundred eighty uh, uh, dollars per firm. So uh, the idea here is to see if like with small, relatively small shock, uh, a small shock is enough to switch firms uh, from you know offline to online, uh, or they need like a big shock to do the, you know, a big push to do, you know, to respond. So I can't uh, tell you that um, um, for the training program we found nothing. You know, the take-up rate was uh, about 50%. Uh, we had a lot of challenges because the first idea was to bring this business to a center and provide the training to many businesses at the same time, but very few actually showed up for, the, uh, for this training. So at the end of the day, we had to do like a one-on-one -on -one sessions, which increased the cost of the training substantially. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the 50% take-up. Uh, with the 50% take up, we couldn't find any impact on usage of um, uh, e-commerce uh, by, by these businesses. But the demand shock shows some interesting results. So I'll, I'll read this table uh, with you guys. Uh, so uh, let me know if you have any, any question later on. So basically we see here, we have the full sample of firms uh, which is uh, 283, and we we split these groups. First, we have them all grouped, uh, and we test the impacts of, uh, you know, all, you know, shocking these firms with just one order, one online order. So we hired a firm in Georgia, called this firm and say, hey, you would like to buy a product, a product uh, from you, but it has to be online. Would you be uh, able to sell it? Uh, if the firm said yes, it was in the sample. Uh, if, you know, then this is how we, 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 we measure uh, their willingness to, to sell online. Then we split these firms based on their propensity to sell online. So, well, yes, I can sell. The other said, well, I need to set up my website, but I would like to do so. And the other one said, well, we we'll have to receive a big, uh, uh, you know, order in order to, to, to switch online. Otherwise, I wouldn't do that. So we, we group these firms based on their propensity to, to, to sell online. But first, we, we, we group them all here. And we see that by offering these uh, online orders, we actually bought their products, products online. Uh, we increased the, their online presence by 26 percentage points. Right? Uh, when we look at impacts of the small shock, which is $130 per firm, the impact is 21 percentage points. But when we look at the large shock, it's 30 percentage points. You see, I mean, even though the difference 10 percentage points, uh, it suggests that the large shock is not cost effective because it was way more costly than the $130 shock. When we split these firms based on their propensity to sell online, we see that the firm, uh, firms with high propensity to sell online, the impact was huge. Uh, it, it was 50 percentage points, uh, you know, for uh, firms receiving $130 uh, uh, shock uh, and 61 percentage points for firms uh, receiving the large 700-ish uh, 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 dollars per order. So we tell us, uh, a few things. First, uh, it's possible to to increase online presence by securing demand for these businesses. So it seems that they don't switch to this online world because they they don't have a secure demand. Once the demand is there, they figure things out. Uh, they don't necessarily need any training upgrade or any skills upgrade. They sort of uh, realize how they they have to, you know, they figure things out pretty much. And firms with high propensity to to sell online, the impact can be huge. Uh, but firms with low propensity to sell online, 
uh, the impact is, is, is small, but still positive if they receive, receive a big enough shock. So this is interesting because it gives us a sense of the targeting of this type of interventions, right? If the budget is relatively uh, small, uh, it, then the policymaker needs to decide whether it's going to invest the budget in a training program or, for example, in something that's going to try to spur demand for these businesses. And if it decides to go for the demand shock or some sort of support for demand, then the choice is, um, you know, who I'm going to target uh, my intervention, who I'm going to target to with my intervention. And here it's clear that uh, some sort of screening to realize who is more willing to sell or to respond to your intervention would be like uh, worthwhile. Just to conclude, um, so the low intensity training intervention failed to increase the online presence of small businesses. Uh, this one off demand shock is promising. Um, the large demand shock was not cost effectiveness, uh, is not cost effective, and the results show that lack of demand is a key barrier for adoption of e commerce among small firms. And uh, firms not necessarily need, uh, you know, more skills or, or more training to provide those skills. They sort of figure things out on their own. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Caio. Thank you to all of our presenters. Really appreciate it. We are maybe running a couple of minutes over, but we've had some uh, great presentations and some wonderful questions. Uh, so we'll turn to the Q&A session now. And we, um, I encourage you to continue to add your questions here into the chat. Um, I believe the audio uh, functions and such are disabled for our participants. So since there are so many of you, so please uh, continue to drop those in and we will get to all of them. And uh, if we run out of time, we'll still get to you somehow. Um, so since uh, Kaya just gave the last presentation, I'd like to just uh, start with a couple of questions for him. So first off, uh, this is one that was mentioned from David. Can you also mention what type of businesses, sector type, et cetera, um, that you used here? And then also, here's another one. Um, and then it's great to hear about, um, or did any of the participants have online stores and was logistics and transportation an area of intervention that you would look into supporting businesses in? This is for you, Caio, and then also we'll turn it to the others as well to address. Thank you. Over to you, Caio. Thank you. Uh, well, these are great, great uh, questions. Uh, I'll start with the last one, uh, with the second one. The transportation cost was actually uh, something we were worried about because uh, we actually did a survey and, uh, you know, frankly, the, uh, the, the mail service there is not great. Uh, it's important to say that this intervention took place uh, not in the capital of Georgia, Tbilisi, but, in, you know, in, uh, uh, smaller municipalities where connection is actually tr trickier. Uh, but we, we screen uh, these businesses to be part of the demand shock experiment. We sort of uh, have here a business that had an online presence, but were not using their, uh, you know, this online presence to 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 make money to to try to expand the market, they were not selling in spite of being uh, present online. Uh, and the, then we we also asked them if they would be willing to, if they would be able to deliver all these questions. Then we sort of came up with the sample for for the for the experiment. We we screened these uh, firms um, to make sure that we wouldn't have any problem with with those logistics that you you mentioned. Uh, so that's a question one. The, the first one is the type of businesses and sectors. Well, th these are very diverse, to be honest. We have hotels, for example, small hotels. We have, uh, you know, some grocery stores like, uh, you know, small markets. Uh, and we have um, 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 health providers. Uh, we have um, some in education. Uh, we, we described all this uh, in the paper in detail, but uh, uh, for us, it was a big surprise that the sector actually, we were hoping firms to be more uh, homogeneous in a way, but actually they a little bit spread over uh, different sectors.
All right, thank you. Uh, next uh, question, um, and this is for everybody, and I'll read off a couple of questions for everybody, and then I'll actually turn it to, um, uh, to um, actually, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to start with responses, and then we'll go to Anna, and and then uh, Kyor just kind of cycle on through. So um, it's uh, great to hear about the interventions on the demand side of SMEs, um, but um, Hans, and I think all of us would also be interested to hear more on what needs to be done on the capital supply side as well, pra as well um, practical and sustainable solutions to increase lender risk appetite. And then uh, another question is, what about the impact of in-kind grants, for example, equipment? Um, so we'll start with Sarah and then we'll uh, continue on through. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so I can, I can comment on the in-kind grants. So we, we did look for evidence um, with respect to what was the, you know, it, impact or uh, for interventions that we're providing in kind grants and we did not identify any evidence, um, any new evidence published since 2018 and then the previous review had also not um, identified any evidence. So we, we in our report, we do um, highlight this as a key gap in the evidence. Um, so this is an area for future uh, study um, and then I will. Pass it off to my colleague Mohammed, um, who also was involved in um, the evidence review. If he has anything additional to share, hi everyone. Yeah, no, I concur with uh, with Sarah. Like we we had the matching grant section in the in the review, but uh, nothing sort of showed up in terms of in kind uh, grants. So it's it is a gap we we recommend. Uh, future research to focus on. Great, thank you very much. And then um, also uh, back to you, Sarah, there were a couple of questions earlier and um, thank you for addressing those. That's one of the privileges of going first. Is there anything else you wanted to say about some of these uh, questions? And then we'll go back to some of the uh, unanswered questions. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, I, I saw that some of the other participants had um, engaged in conversations about this, you know, looking at whether micro enterprises or small medium enterprises. Um, it looks like Dick Tinsley had raised um, this point. And so in our review, we, we did do a comprehensive search and a lot of the evidence, um, I think, as a couple of folks had mentioned in the chat, a lot of the evidence really was looking at micro enterprises. Um, but we put a, we put very clear parameters around what we were looking at because we did want to identify um, evidence that was strictly focused on supporting small and medium enterprises to fill that evidence gap and, and in our review. There are still lots of um, very large evidence gaps um, with respect to supporting small and medium enterprises. So there's still a lot of work to be done to better understand what what approaches, what targeting, what approaches, interventions, or strategies are um, uh, actually effective for supporting the growth of different types of SMEs. So not that we're discounting the importance of supporting micro enterprises, but there is a lot of research and evidence out there on that. And we, we just wanted to put a parameters around focusing on small and medium enterprises. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Uh, let me turn it to um, Anna. I believe that um, she also has a response to these and then I'll go to the, the next set of questions that are also for everybody. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Yes, a couple of thoughts. So one is that these studies are very, very useful as proof of concept, right? Like we are not saying that these solutions are going to be the panacea everywhere, but we're saying, well, this is uh, something, a solution that might work, right? And so in the Georgia study, the demand shock uh, is an area that is, is not researched uh, broadly. There was a previous study in Egypt on, uh, you know, uh, David Atkin with ROGS, where they also had this concept, this concept of secure orders. But the idea here is to learn by doing. So you get this uh, 
purchased, somebody will purchase your product, and this is external, that's why we call it demand shock, right? But the idea is that with that purchase, you learn about how to do the delivery, how to deal with transportation issues, you learn about how much your product, uh, how much it takes for your product to arrive, you learn if the customer is satisfied or not. So this was all a proof of concept that sometimes you don't need to focus on the on each of the problems, you know, the transportation, the cost consumer rating and all that. But sometimes it's about making things happen and learning on the go. So as a proof of concept, this is this was a very important study. And I wanted to use this uh, notion of proof of concept to answer the other question on capital uh, supply. So with the capital supply, uh, the issue is that, you know, the banking sector, the financial sector, they are so used to using a specific type of information to assess credit worthiness uh, of uh, the, the, the people that are uh, requesting loans. And uh, that type of information, unfortunately, is not of a high quality or not available in developing countries. Uh, so, for example, SMEs often they do not have collaterals, they do not have many years uh, of being established, maybe they are very new, sometimes they don't have financial statements, so they don't have everything that traditionally is requested uh, for uh, a bank loan. So what we need to do is to use this proof of concept approach and try to test or pilot alternatives to that traditional model. And we're doing that, for example, in Nigeria, Burkina Faso. So in Nigeria, they are piloting this concept of using the cash flow of a firm as one of the measures of their uh, potential for repayment. So, for example, if you have uh, a firm and the firm can share their sales, weekly sales, and I know that there is money that is a inflow of money every week in the firm, then I as a bank have that data and I can make certain decisions on how to structure a loan or how to do some sort of alternative offering for that type of firm. Uh, some other studies, they are looking into whether firms pay the, their bills on time, like uh, banks will look if the firms pay the electricity on time, if they pay you know, their, their water, their, their regular operation bills on time and trying to use that information as um, uh, information uh, that tells a little bit about their risk of repayment. Um, the experiment in Nigeria uses the cash flows and the other experiment that I mentioned in Burkina Faso, uh, this one is a bit on hold because of the country situation, but the, the concept of the study is, is very good is a credit guarantee so but the 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 smes don't know it so it's blind the smes don't know but there is this other agency that partner with the banks and if there is a problem in repayment we will uh, chip in and sort of bear the risk with you uh with the bank on the on the lack of, of repayment uh, this is important because, again, it's proof of concept. The idea is try it out. Go ahead and lend to SMEs and let's see if that affects the healthiness of your portfolio. And, and, and this is the whole concept of, uh, you know, these types of studies that would allow us to do uh, these pilots of proof of concept. But in the area of capital supply, it's very important to consider, you know, alternatives to measuring credit worthiness that do not rely on collaterals uh, and then also try to explore more the concept of guarantees even if they are blind and, and the firms don't know it but just to prove that this could be healthy portfolios. Um, wonderful, thank you Anna. Uh, let me actually um, start with you actually for um, uh, a couple of questions, and then we'll also take it around. Um, one, um, did the colored dots indicate something about those interventions on your last slide? Um, and then also, um, the 
concept of group consulting is interesting. It would be good to hear more about what this looks like to help us at USAID and everyone here consider potential for inclusion in our programming. Um, so I'll start with Anna on that. And then uh, to everybody, um, and starting with Kayo, did any of the participants have online stores and was logistics and transportation an area of intervention that you would look into supporting businesses in? Thank you. Um, over to you, Anna, and then Kayo. Okay. Yeah, on, on group ones, on the dots, yes, they came differently in, in online, so that's why I didn't mention, but it was a sort of a stoplight color, red, yellow, and uh, green. And <laughs> I don't know the colors that appear on the screen. It was purple and something else, so I didn't mention. But um, the, the idea was that the, the solutions that had the green dot means that there were more studies, uh, you know, 10 or so uh, RCTs on that particular solution. Then the yellow ones had only a handful of studies available and the red ones had very few, one or no studies available on that particular solution. So those were the dots. On group, con I, I also comment on, on group consulting and how it looks like. So it's, it's about having a group of firms together uh, learning with some sort of a coach, or uh, it could also be an expert. And the study in Colombia is published. You can go ahead and read there. They, they do explain a lot more detail there. But some one consideration that was important is how do you, when we are thinking about is how do you form the groups? because it is very different if you are in the room with somebody that can be your competitor. So you don't want firms that are actually very similar because maybe they don't open up and they are not going to say, you know, oh, we are, we are not good at identifying our consumers or our processes are really not working. Uh, so there was a lot of thought into how do you put these groups together and one idea is to look at value chains and put in the same group uh, sort of suppliers uh, and buyers, for example, of certain products instead of uh, putting people that could be um, doing exactly the same, uh, putting people that can collaborate somehow for businesses. So this idea of how do you form the groups is important. Uh, in the case of, of Colombia, I think it was groups from, if I remember correctly, from five to ten uh, people. And in Ghana, uh, we are going to be also piloting this again, uh, but this is very early stage. Uh, so I, and these are the only two studies that I know about, but I don't know, Cayo, if you, if you know any others. No, uh, this is the only one I, I'm aware of that has the uh, two approaches. Um, uh, yeah, um, just a quick uh, comment on this uh, screening you mentioned, you know, the Capital One. Uh, there are some papers out there testing the impact of uh, replacing uh, collateral by psychometric tests, for example. You know, and uh, apparently the psychometric tests, they are good predictors of whether or not a firm is going to default. And uh, there are some, uh, uh, you know, institutions and also some experimental evidence on, on that front in case uh, the participants are interested in. So on the, the question, uh, I, I, I think I already mentioned something about this question, Andrew, but, uh, you know, the, the, the participants have online stores, but uh, happy to, to go over it again. Uh, I think maybe the, the second part, whether the logistics and transportation was an area of intervention that uh, we look into. No, we did not, but um, we took everything uh, in place for granted, and uh, we sort of screened the businesses to be in the demand shock experiment to make sure they wouldn't face any logistical challenge to uh, ship their uh, items or to people, for example, book uh, room in their hotel and be able to access it and so on. Uh, we didn't face that those issues, but I can tell you that our team here in Dime, uh, there are multiple projects where uh, the idea is to help, you know, the smallholders uh, gain access to 
uh, markets and this transportation is a big issue. The, you know, the road is not there or, you know, the, the intermediate uh, is taking advantage because, it, you know, and so on. And there are some interventions uh, ongoing looking exactly at, uh, you know, how to overcome this uh, you know, logistics and transportation barriers to help these smallholders gain access to markets and better price and so on. Happy to uh, connect you with, uh, with our colleagues here. Um, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I see uh, we're getting a few more questions in as well. Thank you, Caio. Um, so let me um, first, uh, let me group two questions together. One is addressed to everybody and then one maybe uh, we'll, we'll start with Sarah. So this first one is uh, from David. Cost effectiveness was referenced multiple times in regards to training as well as um, market inception. Um, but for example, what is optimal cost of TA? training or sales incentive for business, um, which has, let's say, 100 employees and can create additional 20 or 30 new jobs as a result of TA support. That's from David. Then the second one, um, this is from Katie, related to the dearth of evidence on the intersection of climate and SME growth, is the literature similarly lacking in evidence approaches to disaster risk um, management capacity within firms. Uh, for example, reducing diversifying supply chain risk. So I'll start with uh, Sarah and then we'll go around um, for the rest of your comments if you have any. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks, Katie and David, for those questions. Um, I'll, I'll respond first to uh, the question on climate um, and the lack of evidence there and then pass it off to my colleague, Mohammed, um, about the cost effectiveness question. Um, so, with respect to the dearth of evidence on the intersection of climate and SME growth, this was something that we were looking to explore in, um, in this review. And as we kind of searched for this, this evidence, we registered and realized how vast the types of interventions that there are that could be um, targeting, supporting, um, reducing, or addressing risk management and in, um, in this space. Um, and and with that, it expanded beyond just looking at climate. And so um, to we didn't necessarily specifically look at, you know, interventions or approaches that are building disaster risk management capacity within firms um, as a specific intervention or type of intervention. And so we can't necessarily comment on that. Um, but we can say that there was overall just a lack of evidence that was really looking or overall a lack of evidence that um, met the criteria. There's a lot of observational studies, but really missing these types of experimental design um, studies that are focusing um, in this space. Um, and then I'll pass it off to Mohammed um, to comment about the cost effectiveness question. Sure. So, um, so just as a disclaimer, I mean, we never had, there aren't like cutoff figures or defined in terms of the number of employees or the number of jobs created. But what we saw, I mean, and we updated from the previous uh, the original evidence review was that the evidence review had come up with a conclusion that consulting services seemed to be more effective when it came to have an impact on growth and firm performance. But in terms of cost effectiveness, they did say that for, for SMEs, group consulting services seemed to be more effective. Uh, and when it came to insourcing and outsourcing, it was only effective when the firm had sufficient resources and growth potential uh, to to undergo them. So if they if there wasn't that sort of the the, the resources, the sufficient resources or the growth potential, it wouldn't be a, a very cost effective approach because they would still have the financial constraints that SMEs usually have when facing in, similar to what they uh, have when they face uh, when they're trying to recruit individual uh, consulting services. So we don't really have exact numbers of where where the cutoff is exactly, but uh, the you know when it if we're talking about SMEs in general, the evidence we have so far, and we still need more studies because, like my colleagues mentioned, when it came to group consulting, we don't have that many studies. But from the study we have so far, it seems to be to indicate that that might be a more cost-effective approach for 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 SMEs that are looking for consulting uh, services. But for insourcing and outsourcing, it seems to be more restricted to firms of a certain, uh, of a larger size and a larger like growth potential. Um, so, with in terms of your specific numbers, I wouldn't be able to give you a, a concrete answer because 
it, it's not that clearly defined yet. I think there are more studies required to be able to come up with uh, more uh, customized uh, uh, evidence. Uh, thanks so much, Mohammed. Um, anything else, for, uh, Sarah? Before, or we can turn it to Anna and Kayo to uh, have any responses. No, 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 nothing else from our from our side. Great, Anna or Kayo. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, a couple of reactions. So on um, climate. Uh, I, that is what it is. Uh, so we don't have much evidence uh, yet, uh, but at the same time we are advancing. So so before testing uh, solutions and doing the pilots, what we are doing in the bank, uh, at least in the past five years or so, we have been conducting something that we call the FAT survey, but it's a technology adoption survey. And uh, this service is just to have a diagnostics of how are firms adopting technologies? And so we are recently uh, now adding a green module uh, to understand if they are using energy efficiency um, solutions and so forth. And so that's sort of the first step for us is to understand where uh, firms are in terms of adoption of uh, green technologies or green practices. And definitely this is the area of growth uh, for uh, an area of growth for, for impact evaluation. So in this program, um, I mentioned we have been implementing the program for five years and for 10 years, and it typically we run into five year cycles. So, so the first uh, cycle was very focused on regulatory reforms. And we were measuring things about, um, you know, business entry, uh, permits and all that. The second cycle was uh, focused on SME growth. And so this is the one that we presented today and we learn a lot about consulting, training, linkages, and even access to finance. And now we are at a, at a not point where our next cycle is very, is going to be uh, very, fo a, lo a lot uh, about uh, this intersection of climate and firms. And so we hope, uh, you know, that in, in few years, as I said, this will take years, but I hope that the evidence on this front will will increase. Uh, we see a there are a couple of studies on climate change mitigation uh, because this is an outcome that is uh, at the end of the day measurable. We can measure emissions, right? And so that's very easy. But our challenge, what we are trying to think very hard about, is how do we experiment and study climate change adaptations, because this is the issue in most of uh, developing countries. They are not uh, large, uh, they don't have large emissions, but they have to adapt to large, to high temperatures. They have to adapt to, to risk uh, uh, of uh, flooding or drought. So, so this is where we are thinking is how do we uh, conduct pilots that have to do with climate change adaptations? And again, the outcomes are not that easy. Then on the opti optimal cost, I fully agree with Mohammed. We don't have a, a specific number. Also, every country is so different and the markets are so different that it's very difficult to provide even a, a range. However, if you look at the studies that have been conducting on consulting, something that you could look at is the length or the intensity of the training or the consulting mechanism. So, for example, you have some training programs at the beginning that they were not found uh, uh, too much uh, of an impact, but these are, you know, even Kayo's, you know, example of a three hour training, right? Or one hour training. And then you have the extreme uh, was the India study that offered, I don't know, intensive, uh, I think it was a year long support, right? Uh, so if we look at the studies that are, they had some positive impact and uh, the, the, the on, on business uh, growth uh, and look at the hours of support, some of a uh, rule of thumb is around 100, many studies have around 100 hours, but they are not necessarily offered all at once. 
So the idea is to offer 100 hours in the course of six months and then give some flexibility. And, and this is because firms often cannot commit to so much time, for example, to ask a firm owner uh, of a five people firm to go for a whole day of training is a big undertaking, right? So that's why we need this flexibility, but in general, these programs, some of the programs that offer 100 hours over five or more months have been uh, found uh, impactful. I'll stop, uh, Kayo, back to go to you. A yeah, quick comment on, on this. Um, so let's take this two extreme cases where you have um, a cheap intervention, uh, you know, you know, three days uh, training program as the one we had in Georgia, but that had zero impact. You know, it was very cheap, but had no impact, right? So it's not cost effective. On the other hand, you have the Zinja uh, example that uh, you know, um, Accenture uh, was hired to provide, uh, you know, consulting for six months uh, to this uh, business, large firms in India, cost a lot of money, but the effect on the productivity was 17%, it's huge. So, you know, it's cost effective because it had an impact, but it was, it was cost, costly in a way, but, you know, it delivered down the line. So, Ideally, if you have to pick one of the sides, I would definitely pick the one that was costly but delivered than the other one. But these local providers, uh, you know, SME business service providers that are present in, in, in developing countries, they tend to uh, prioritize coverage. So they provide their service to thousands of small businesses, uh, but these are light touch interventions and they're not going to be transformational. So there is a, you know, some trade-off there. Instead of targeting everybody with some light touch intervention, it would be much better to do something similar to the study that Sarah mentioned that was uh, also done by uh, David McKenzie and uh, Stephen Anderson, the insourcing outsourcing consulting. Instead of training these firms or these entrepreneurs uh, to become better, uh, uh, develop some managerial skills, for example, it would be more, more cost effective than somebody there who has these skills. Uh, spend some time with this, uh, you know, managers, entrepreneurs, and this, uh, you know, learning by doing can have happen, you know, in the business. You know, these guys like start mimicking or start learning uh, from others, and this is the way more cost effective than, you know, bringing somebody or everybody to like a, a room, classroom, and then teach them, you know, how to, you know, do some, you know, financing uh, matrix, etc. right? So we know that this type of training doesn't, doesn't really uh, help much. So just to finalize, David, unfortunately, we don't have an answer for uh, your question, but we don't know, uh, you know, uh, how to increase, uh, you know, the number of employees by X uh, through uh, some intervention. This is something that uh, needs to be figured out and this is a case by case uh, thing, unfortunately. We would love to know the answer. Oh, wonderful, thank you, Kayo. Um, I know we're uh, right at time. I'll let uh, Sarah have a last word and then I'll wrap us up. Thank you. Absolutely. And so I just wanted to thank everybody uh, for your participation and great questions. Um, it was really exciting to be able to present this evidence focused on small and medium enterprises and looking forward to seeing new evidence generated in the coming years um, to help identify or help fill these identified gaps. Um, and thanks to Andrew and everyone at Market Links for putting this on. Um, wonderful. Thank you, everybody. You can see. Um... The link to the survey and um, in the chat here. Want to thank all of our uh, speakers and um, for Sarah, um, Anna, and Kayo, and also for Jenny at Market Links for doing so many things that all of you can't see behind the background here. Um, uh, Weiwei, we see your comment. We'll get to you. Your question, we'll get to you. And uh, we just encourage all of you to continue to um, engage in a dialogue with um, all of us here and with each other 
Um, this is an exciting area that uh, needs all of our effort and continued work in. So thank you, everybody. Um, and I appreciate everybody for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.